Hey gang, we are at Forest Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery. We're in Hollywood Hills, California today, beautiful day. And we are here to visit the grave of a man named Lockard Martin. Lockard Martin played in a very famous movie that I'm sure many of you have seen, called classic favorite of mine called The Day the Earth Stood Still. 1951 movie that came out that just kind of revolutionized science fiction in the well it didn't revolutionize science fiction itself it revolutionized the genre to be taken seriously before it was flash gordon and all those shows for kids if you will and adults but this was the first serious attempt to make a science fiction and what's neat is they wanted to put a message behind it an important human message which they they did very effectively so let's take a walk we're at this outdoor mausoleum and we'll take a walk through there and then we're going to walk down to they called him Locke, Locke Martin's grave down the hill. He was born in Pennsylvania and quickly it was discovered that he had a well I don't I don't know what you would call it a malady or a, a condition called gigantism because he just never stopped growing and of course that's one of the reasons he played in this movie the day the earth stood still he was it was caused by an overproduction of growth hormone and he got through I mean he was doing great he, he was obviously a standout and some of the jobs that he had early on reflected that I mean he directed traffic at Bob's Big Boy Drive-In restaurant in Van Nuys here in Van Nuys in 51 and he also traveled around with this traveling show Have you ever heard of Spike Jones and his city slickers in the 50s it was on TV real character he was, musician, band leader, kind of spoofing things, songs and music, classical music, gunshots, whistles, cowbells, <laughs> burps, all kinds of crazy stuff. And after that, he got involved with the Grauman's Chinese Theater, which is pretty famous here in Los Angeles. Grauman's you've probably heard of. He was the doorman there. Can you imagine what an imposing sight that was when you would have walked in there to see him? They say he was between seven feet, seven foot one and seven foot six. And there's conflicting information on that. Now, after that, he did get some small acting roles. He played in a movie called The Incredible Shrinking Man. Of course, he played the circus giant, but sadly, his scenes were, were all deleted. And just when you think things were coming to an end, this is when he landed this role. And the role that he would play would be for the scary robot called Gort, G-O-R-T. A little background on the movie, aside that it was very revolutionary, was it was directed by a guy named Robert Wise. Now, Robert Wise was a pretty famous guy. He worked initially on the movie Citizen Kane. He was an editor and he worked his way up to directing. Real talented. And he saw the script and he's like, I really want to do this. The script was based on a book. It was called Farewell to the Master, written by Harry Bates. Now, at the time, we were in the Cold War, of course. It's 1951. Well, before 51, that's when it was released. And nuclear weapons we saw ending the Pacific War in World War II. Everybody was all afraid, a lot of tensions that we now had the power to destroy ourselves. So this movie came 
at a perfect time. And I say a lot of times these movies are really, a, 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 when you watch them, these old movies, they're a sign of the era that they were, they were shot in. And, but the, what they wanted to do is they wanted to take a different approach and not just come out with, you know, aliens attacking. It was more the other way around. It was more, let's, let's have the aliens come in peace and let's just show humans, mankind's frailties and all our petty differences, all our relationships like between countries and all the divisions and territories. And of course, to try to stop us from killing ourselves and killing the planet or probably spreading our disease to other planets. They were, they were the next planet over in the next star system. So he came to give us the warning. His name was Klaatu and he was played by Michael Rennie. Now Michael Rennie was a British actor, really perfect for the role. And I will tell you that not only was he perfect, but he won the role of over Claude Rains. Now Claude Rains actually was busy at the time. Can't say he really won it over. It was for him. And he kind of turned it down. He's busy. But when they saw Michael Rennie, they said, this is Klaatu. And, you know, you think of Claude Rains in that role now, and it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit at all. So he got the role, and they started the development of the movie. And it, it was, there's some really interesting backstory on the movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still, aside from it being, you know, as it was revolutionary to talk about. Now, one of the things I find really interesting is that the flying saucer that they used was built of wood and I think plaster or paper mache actually, but that was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, who I'm a, a big hero of mine, architect. And it was modeled after Johns, uh, the Johnson, Johnson Wax in Wisconsin, I've been there. And if you look at it, it's revolutionary design. And so it was with the flying saucer which has amazing lines if you look at it. Now one of the other interesting things is that to get that effect, you know, they had that effect with the, the door opening and closing and it was just seamless. Well, the way they did that is they caulked, you know, they closed the door and they caulked the crack and they painted it over, sanded it, painted it, so it was just perfect. And of course, when the door opens, it breaks apart. So my question to you would be, how do you get the door to close? How do you, you know, the ramp the same way, how do you get the ramp to go up and it just all disappears, it's seamless. Simple and clever. They just ran it in reverse. And boy, it came off, didn't it? It came off. Oh, this is beautiful in here, look at this. We have statues anchoring each wall. And it's an open air, open skylight, if you will. Beautiful Carrera marble sculptures. And interestingly, there's a Liberty Bell here, right on the floor. Look at that. Let's continue. Some more interesting facts about the movie was that that scene at the beginning with the army and the tanks and the guns and the, the soldiers was really lucky that that happened that way because the Department of Defense hated the script. They said, we don't want to do this. We don't want to be involved in this and you're not going to get to use any of our, any of our hardware. And 
just kind of going around them. It turned out, I don't know how it happened, but the 3rd Armored Cavalry at Fort Meade on its own chipped in the tanks, equipment, and guys. So all those soldiers you see, you know, and that's at the beginning of the movie, after the flying saucer lands, where Gort, and let me tell you, and we'll talk about Gort and Locke and the suit, the problems, but that head, it's iconic. And it's kind of, you know, you look back at it now, it's kind of like William Shatner in the Twilight Zone and the ghoul on the wing, you know, the, the goblin. It's, you kind of laugh at it, but it's pretty cool. But that helmet, you know, when it opened, it has a whole mechanism inside to get that light to go. And, oh, man, it's just, just a lot of breakthroughs in that movie. And so those guys chipped in. It was pretty cool. And the music they used, it was, it was literally, of course, you know, out of this world music. It's suspenseful, eerie. It, it was totally pioneering. And there was a guy named Bernard Herrmann who was the composer who invented it, if you will. And he was a known guy. He worked with Orson Welles and Alfred Hitchcock. And I guess from what I understand, he used high tones and low tones to make that effect happen. And man, is it distinctive. It's, it's spooky. It's still like today. Now for Locke, I was, I was alluding, things were pretty tough. He wore this suit, right? This robot suit. Now that robot suit, you know, looked like metal, and you have to give them credit how they did that. It's pretty original. But it's really made of foam and rubber, two layers, and it was killing. It was so hot in there. Now, Locke wasn't a strong guy. He did not, he, he was actually very weak. And even if he were regular size, it's just something probably to do with the giant, giantism. But he could not even carry, like he could not stand on the ramp because the ramp was on an angle. They had to use a dummy, a sculpture for that. He could only stand straight and he could barely walk. And when it came time to carry Patricia Neal, they had to use wires. And if you look close, you'll see them. And in other scenes, they had to use a dummy. But I, I'll tell you, the director, Robert Wise, was very, what a good guy. He was very sensitive to Locke's predicament. He basically made everybody stop after a half hour. He was always asking, are you doing okay? Are you doing okay? How are you? You know, you don't hear about that in those days. The suit had zippers on all sides. Not any one suit. They had, I think, three suits. One with zippers in the front for shots from behind. And they had a suit with zippers in the back, shots in the front, and then in the side for sideways shots on the opposite side. So when the movie came out, it was kind of like the Twilight Zone in that, which came later, about eight years later, what was that, in 59? It wasn't a big deal. It, it did get some critical acclaim. And actually, in France, the critics loved it. And then here, of course, got a lot of criticism. I mean, those guys did not understand science fiction. This is the first real serious one. So let's walk down to his grave as we watch the deer. Didn't know there were deer out here. Now we know what the deer thrive on. They love those flowers. Right at the curve of the road is where his grave is. Right here, I'll step between these graves. And here it is, right here.
Jay Lockard Martin, beloved husband and father, 1916, 1959, until the daybreak and the shadows flee away. It's a beautiful marker. I'm guessing the sunrise to the next life. Locke actually died from something called Marfan syndrome. It's a rare genetic disorder that affects the connective tissue, the lungs, the heart. It just starts falling apart, so very, very sad. And I see here his wife, Ethel Babcock, marked here, of course, married name Ethel Martin. She passed in 1972, it looks like. Same epitaph, same exact marker for the two of them. I don't see any other family members here, so. Well, they called him the gentle giant, Locke Martin. He loved kids. He would read to kids. He had a TV show for kids in the 50s called The Gentle Giant. And as Gort, the command, Klaatu, Barada, Nikto, that was the sign to get Gort to stop. Locke and Ethel, hope you're, you're resting in peace. And rest in peace to the Martins. Thank you.